<laughs> Welcome to the Shift Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your weekly overview of precious metals and market updates. I'm your host, J.D. Bauman, and I'm here with my brother, Joel. Thanks for tuning in. Joel, great to see you. Happy Friday. Happy Friday, J.D. You uh, ready for Mother's Day? Does Schiff Gold have any kind of gold products that women or mothers would love? <laughs> it sounds like a, like a softball for a plug. Um, no, we don't, but... It's not out of the realm to to have some sort of twenty four karat or, or gold or platinum jewelry. So maybe one day, but not not today. Maybe one day. Let's let's jump into the news of the week. So yeah, let's go. Gold is trading at two thousand three hundred sixty per ounce. It's up about fifty eight dollars since this time last week. Silver is also up. We're at twenty eight dollars and fourteen cents per ounce. That's a dollar and sixty cents higher since the close last week. The dollar index is about the same at 105.31, and the VIX, the fear gauge, is a tad lower at 12.55. The big news moving metals this week from the headlines was, one, the jobless claims, and two, the consumer sentiment. So jobless claims jumped to their highest level in nine months. Claims rose 22,000 to 231,000 total. And the consumer sentiment was... If you remember, it was it was seventy seven point two last month. It dipped all the way down to sixty seven point four. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, pretty big decline. Uh, month to month decline of twelve point seven percent. You know, Americans are expecting overall inflation to stay high. They're expecting next year's inflation to to be three point five percent, way above what the what the Fed is is targeting. You know, last week we we talked about a lot of Fed announcements. This week, right? None of those announcements themselves indicated any kind of shifting of investment behavior or shifting gold prices. But this bad news the last day or so has raised expectations of a Fed rate cut by about three or 4%. So metals are up on the news. But here, why don't you share with us a bit about that? What's been some of the, the movement you've been seeing in the technicals? Not a whole lot to report on the price action side. Most of it just a testing of or trying to test the highs. Like you mentioned, a lot of price action happening today. Gold hitting its high of the week around 2380-ish at one o'clock today. Got a few hours after the bad economic data. Silver almost hitting the 29 handle to properly get up in the test 30s. We'll have to wait and see on that front. Uh, but other than that, JD, I don't have too much to report. I did forget to mention last week that we we're going to have the Berkshire Hathaway annual shareholder meeting on Sunday, which is yes. always a highlight. Were you for in me. Omaha? Were you, <laughs> did you go to the Midwest this week? I didn't go, and they wouldn't wouldn't even let me in if I did go because I I'm not a shareholder, so I wouldn't. You have too much money in gold, yeah. <laughs> but problem. I I lean in like you know Buffett, you know this might be one of his last years, so I, I want to hear what he has to say. Yeah, and we don't agree with everything that Mr. Buffett right. has to say, but he's no doubt a legendary investor. And it's just wise to listen to, <laughs> to, to to smart, successful investors. So he's been pretty quiet lately since the passing of his his partner, Charlie Munger. Mm. I know, Joel, you, you really looked up to Munger and quoted his Mungerisms frequently. Yeah, sad to see him uh, not on stage this year. So one of the big news from Berkshire Hathaway lately has been their Apple stock uh, investments. So Apple stock is over 50% of Berkshire's portfolio. They own over 900 million shares. That comes out to a whopping $174 billion. In this quarter, quarter two, they've sold about $20 billion worth. And later in the meeting, Buffett alluded to some of his thought process on this. I want to quote him here. And in this quote, Buffett mentions Greg Abel, his chosen successor. Buffett said, unless something really extraordinary happens, we will own Apple, American Express, and Coca-Cola when Greg takes over this place. But I don't mind at all under current conditions of building cash positions. Mm. I look at the alternative of what's available in equity markets, and I look at the composition of what's going on in the world, and we find it quite attractive. So Joel, what's the big takeaway here? So this is kind of a big deal. If you're familiar with uh, Charlie Munger or Warren Buffett's in value investing, you know their, their Benjamin Graham kind of principled Buffettology style, they don't make moves on macroeconomics. So the fact that they're selling and raising capital, you could kind of you know expect that. But um, for them to make such a big move, it's one thing to talk about it, but to sell almost $20 billion worth of stock. This is raising their cash balance to $189 billion. So they're getting ready for something. 
Uh, do you think they're bearish on the markets? Or are they making some kind of bigger prediction about the way things are headed? Well, that's the thing is Buffett o- always is quoted for saying, you know, we're going to swim. We're going to swim the best we can and the tide will take care of itself. Kind of saying, hey, macroeconomics is not something that we as value investors are concerned with. Nor principally, right. he beat the S&P for decades, just focusing in on finding value, making big plays when they can, and then just leaving cash on the side. But to sell out of their favorite stock, building capital, calling it quite attractive, despite what they're looking at in the world and seeing you know, the world's composition of what's happening afar, to sell and then raise capital is just, it's kind of a no-no. Buffett doesn't do this. So the fact that they're doing it- Yeah, but maybe- yeah, I mean, the fact that they're doing it might be them just taking profits, right? Like corporate tax rates are low, at the lowest we've seen in a while, 21%. In the past, they've been 35% or more. You know, Buffett maybe expects just taxes to go up. Maybe maybe they're just being like tax-wise here. Corporate rates went from 35 they're down at to 21%. So it's it makes sense with our current fiscal spending. We're going to see higher corporate taxes in the near future. Buffett, of course, of all people is conscious of that. But the fact that he's just making a move at all, like on macroeconomics, is just, it's not very Buffett-esque, if you will. And so this is, you know, this is a a dark cloud uh, for for a guy who just holds stocks thick and thin, especially Apple, which has been Berkshire's favorite stock for a while. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what else they're selling. I know we don't have the 13F filings, uh, which give us a glimpse into that. So, True. Um, yeah, any other interesting takeaways from the meeting? That was the, the heavy set news. Um, it's good seeing Greg Abel on stage. I've enjoyed listening to his insights for the last couple of years. He's been kind of on it with his energy calls. And so I think whenever Buffett it ends up not coming back to Berkshire and whenever he, he passes away, I think they'll be in good hands for at least, uh, at least a few years. Um, the other thing that was kind of interesting is Warren Buffett pointed out some AI concerns. Uh, I, I kind of like what he said, where mm. AI, the danger there, or one of the dangers is just separating uh, people from their money and just being fooled by artificial intelligence. Buffett stating, scamming is going to be the growth in- industry of all time. Mm. So kind of a little tongue in cheek, but you know, a very uh, you know, candid warning from the Oracle. He of means Omaha. like literal scamming people like scammers or does he just mean like the dot-com bubble people buying into to tech hype oh i think he means scamming like so Literal actual scamming like you know like deep and... deep fakes you know uh, yeah like making like fishing to another level you know deep having... fakes are scary honestly i like now i when i when i watch reels or i watch videos online i i do second guess and wonder like oh is this is this is this actually real i can't tell a lot of the time and have you looked into that in some of the... Were you at the... I'm trying to remember uh, at the dinner party where or, or I was talking about this, where I don't know if the story is true, but I don't know if it was a TikTok or whatever, or a YouTube short, but it was a guy recounting a scam story where it was a banker at a, like you a Singaporean... You did tell me about this, and he basically got some Singaporean employee... Like the scam was basically posing as on a boss, conference right? call. Like got him on a conference call and well that and tricked him into like why are posing money. as a boss? That's like that's been around forever. But to say, hey, can you get on a conference call? And then the conference call supposedly had four or five other bank employees, and the deep fake was imi- uh, imitating all the employees and their voices, and so it had a cluster like multiple variables of kind of scammership, you know. A, a mirage of, of multiple factors because it's one thing you know like the whole boss says hey i need i need you to send a wire now you know you vet that but to have multiple people all saying like yep like let's do this and get it done i, I don't know how true that is but the fact that the technology and some of those deep fake videos uh it's not I inconceivable it. that that can happen with the current technology it's it's terrifying actually it's not inconceivable Uh, and as you get later in your years if you lose your mental faculties at some point well that's who they're going to go for first honestly they're going to go for right the the marginalized the the ones who have wealth but you might be most loose with your fingers on your money if it's if it's your own son or daughter asking for help and it's but it's actually just ai i mean that that's going to get creepy i think that's a that's a plug for non-financial assets uh that that aren't as (laughs) easily swiped right (laughs) Yeah, at least with the gold, there's no AI that can just you can't just wire your gold over in two seconds. There's there's a bit of checks and balances to get the gold out of your Brinks account or you know out of your storage at home. So at least gold has that in its flag, or at least gold has that going for it. 
So speaking of financial assets, stocks are back up. The S&P 500 is back above 5,200, very close to an all-time high. You know, a lot of this is baking in the expectation that the Fed is going to get inflation down and have some kind of soft landing. And that's just wrong. Uh, it, it, at least Peter Peter points out good reasons why we should think it's wrong. Uh, I'm going to quote him here from his podcast earlier in the week. He says, the markets believe the Fed's going to succeed. This is pure nonsense. I look back at the inflation statistics for the last 40 years before the 08 crisis. So 08, 07, going back to 1968. So in those 40 years, there were only three years where inflation was 2% or lower. Mm. The average inflation rate over those years was 4.8%. So uh, Peter continues here. You know, If the Fed wasn't able to cl- come close to 2% during those 40 years, why does anybody think it's going to come anywhere near it over the next 30 years? Mm. Yeah, as always, well put by Peter. And yeah, that bigger position of just such a presumptuous market that will get the soft landing. I won't go too deep into it. We kind of talked about it last week, but it's just, just like that morbidly obese gentleman analogous of him. I'm going to get my weight down. I'm going to diet. I'm going to exercise. And there's not going to be any pain. We're going to get AKA the soft landing. It's just not true. It's not going to happen. Speaking of 700 pounds of men, there was a four person panel with (laughs) Peter, Eric Voorhees, this professor Rubini and Anthony Scaramucci. Did you see any of that, Joel? Yeah, I watched a chunk of it. Uh, Did you watch it? To be candid, I don't it wasn't like a debate you missed out on. It was a little bit cringy. Uh, I'm not a fan of the two versus two format. So for those who aren't familiar, it was uh, Eric Voorhees uh, and Anthony as the pro Bitcoin team. And then this Peter Schiff, obviously on the gold team, along with Professor Rubini. Um, surprise, surprise. It, surprise, surprise. Uh, it just turned into like two or three people talking at the same time. You couldn't, yeah. a lot of jumbling. You couldn't really hear anything. Uh, I just skipped to the parts where it was Eric or and or Peter talking just because it um, – I don't know if you remember, but back in 2018, Eric Voorhees and Peter Schiff had a legendary debate on on Bitcoin versus gold and the future of money in that department. It was, a really, it was kind of like a rematch almost, like listening to them debate each other along mm-hmm. with these two other guys. But one thing I noticed just anecdotally like watching any kind of Bitcoin bait that Peter's involved with, if it lasts more than 10 or 15 minutes – Every time, without doubt, it always just devolves into price performance. You know, Peter's making these eloquent sound points, and then it's just like, okay, what, what's gone right. up in, more in price? Right. <laughs> it's like, like, like whether you like Bitcoin or not, like regardless of what side of the aisle, to make a succinct argument just on price action, it, it just it just brings it to its lowest common denominator. And and you'll see this, like Bitcoin proponents will say, well, Peter, if you could have bought Bitcoin five years ago, would you not have done it? Right. And Peter always says, honestly, it's like, of course, I would have bought Bitcoin. Yeah, I'm not an idiot. Yeah. It's free money. So, and then they say, you're here to hear, folks, Peter regrets not buying Bitcoin. And it's it's like, it's just not an argument. That's all. And I just, there was a bit of that on the, on the podcast. It was a bit of that when Peter was on Fox Business recently too. So, I mean, they have their point, right? Hindsight's 2020, 20, but like, that doesn't mean you should just go long Bitcoin. I should have bought every winning lottery ticket there was, right? Doesn't mean I should put all my money in the lottery now. So exactly, yeah. Let's look ahead to the week to come. We have some more announcements from the Fed next week on Monday. We have some some Fed chairs and, and presidents speaking on a panel on Tuesday. More Fed speak. We have Powell speaking in the morning. We also have producer price index numbers coming out for April. On Wednesday, we have some CPI data, and on Thursday, some jobs numbers. So we'll keep an eye out on these. And Joel, any anything else you're looking forward to this next week in the markets or in your life? I'm looking forward to, to being the best son to mom this weekend. Oh. <laughs> and <laughs> sorry, <laughs> so stupid. No, you covered it pretty well, JD. Uh, just Jerome Powell on Tuesday. I'm curious how he's going to react to the unemployment claims that came out yesterday, and just the fact that. The numbers weren't good. Consumer sentiment being lower. Um, We'll see. Let's close here with a quote of the week. This is from Mises in Theory of Money and Credit. Mises says, The classical or orthodox gold standard alone is a truly effective check on the power of the government to inflate the currency. Without such a check, all other constitutional safeguards can be rendered vain. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you again next week.